Well, that's the problem. The James Webb Space Telescope is upsetting the apple cart. All of a sudden, we realize that we may have to rewrite all the textbooks about the beginning of the universe. In their quest to understand the first stars and galaxies that lit up the cosmos, astronomers are still in the dark but getting closer to enlightenment one discovery at a time. That's the incredible inescapable conclusion from unprecedented discoveries by the James Webb Space Telescope or JWST, the ten billion dollar time machine that just officially closed its first year of observations. Designed to glimpse the faint infrared glow of the universe's earliest luminous objects, Webb's vision reached back into the first few hundred million years after the Big Bang, allowing it to obtain more and better data about newborn galaxies than any other facility yet built. But its haul of galactic baby pictures has proved more bountiful than most researchers dared to dream. Simply put, candidate galaxies in the early universe are popping up in numbers that defy predictions with dozens found so far. And that makes scientists freak out. As Charlotte Mason, an astrophysicist at the University of Copenhagen said, we really weren't expecting this. In the weeks and months following JWST's findings of surprisingly mature early galaxies, theorists and observers scrambled to explain them. Could the bevy of anomalous big and bright early galaxies be illusory, perhaps because of flaws in analyses of the telescope's initial observations? If genuine, could they somehow be explained by standard cosmological models? Or just maybe, were they the first hints that the universe is more strange and complex than even our boldest theories had ever supposed? And the Big Bang Theory, was it wrong? Join us today as we dig deep into how the James Webb Space Telescope broke the universe. To understand the dilemma, let's go back to when the universe was believed to have been formed. After the Big Bang, the infant universe began cooling off. Within a few million years, the roiling plasma that filled space settled down and electrons and protons and neutrons combined into atoms, mostly neutral hydrogen. Things were quiet and dark for a period of uncertain duration known as the cosmic dark ages. Then something happened. Most of the material that flew apart after the Big Bang is made of something we can't see called dark matter. It has exerted a powerful influence over the cosmos, especially at first. In the standard picture, cold dark matter, a term that means invisible or slow-moving particles, was flung about the cosmos indiscriminately. In some areas, its distribution was denser, and in these regions, it began collapsing into clumps. Visible matter, meaning atoms, clustered around the clumps of dark matter. As the atoms cooled off as well, they eventually condensed and the first stars were born. These new sources of radiation recharged the neutral hydrogen that filled the universe during the so-called epoch of reionization. Through gravity, larger and more complex structures grew, building a vast cosmic web of galaxies. Meanwhile, everything kept flying apart. The astronomer Edwin Hubble figured out in the 1920s that the universe is expanding, and in the late 1990s, his namesake, the Hubble Space Telescope, found evidence that the expansion is accelerating. Think of the universe as a loaf of raisin bread. It starts as a mixture of flour and water, yeast and raisins. When you combine these ingredients, the yeast begins respiring and the loaf begins to rise. The raisins within it, stand-ins for galaxies, stretch further apart from one another as the loaf expands. The Hubble telescope saw that the loaf is rising even faster. The raisins are flying apart at a rate that defies their gravitational attraction. This acceleration appears to be driven by the repulsive energy of space itself, so-called dark energy, 
which is represented by the Greek letter A, pronounced lambda. Plug values for A, cold dark matter, and regular matter and radiation into the equations of Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity, and you get a model of how the universe evolves. This lambda, cold dark matter, or ACDM model, matches almost all observations of the cosmos. One way to test this picture is by looking at the very distant galaxies, equivalent to looking back in time to the first few hundred million years after the tremendous clap that started it all. The cosmos was simpler then, its evolution easier to compare against predictions. Astronomers first tried to see the earliest structures of the universe using the Hubble telescope in 1995. Over 10 days, Hubble captured 342 exposures of an empty looking patch of space in the Big Dipper. Astronomers were astonished by the abundance hiding in the inky dark. Hubble could see thousands of galaxies at different distances and stages of development, stretching back to much earlier times than anyone predicted. Hubble would go on to find some exceedingly distant galaxies. In 2016, astronomers found its most distant one, called GNZ11, or GNZ11 if you're Canadian, a faint smudge that they dated to about 400 million years after the Big Bang. This was surprisingly early for a galaxy, but it did not cast doubt on the ACDM model, in part because the galaxy is tiny with just 1% of the Milky Way's mass, and in part because it stood alone. Astronomers needed a more powerful telescope to see whether GNZ11 or GNZ11 was an oddball or part of a larger population of puzzling early galaxies which could help determine whether we are missing a crucial piece of the ACDM recipe. That's why James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST, was born. Renowned as the largest, most powerful observatory ever launched from Earth, the JWST was built to revolutionize our understanding of the universe. Stationed 1.5 million kilometers away from earthly interference and chilled close to absolute zero by its tennis court sized sunshade, the telescope carries a giant segmented mirror and exquisitely sensitive instruments that were designed to uncover details of cosmic dawn never before observed. And that promise was kept. As the first discoveries were obtained, within just weeks after JWST's full operations were beyond astronomers' wildest dreams. It has seen galaxies breathtakingly close to the dawn of time, probe the atmospheres of exoplanets in unprecedented detail, and provided stunning new views of worlds in our solar system. But it's just getting started! As Webb's vision reaches back into the first few hundred million years after the Big Bang, allowing it to obtain more and better data about newborn galaxies than any other facility yet built, at stake is nothing less than our very understanding of how the orderly universe we know emerged from primordial chaos. Webb's early revelations could rewrite the opening chapters of cosmic history, which concern not only distant epochs and faraway galaxies, but also our own existence here in the familiar Milky Way. As JWST scientist Mark McCoffrin, a senior advisor for space and exploration at the European Space Agency said, You build these machines not to confirm the paradigm, but to break it. You just don't know how they will break it. Researchers use a version of the Doppler effect to gauge the distances of objects. This is similar to figuring out the location of an ambulance based on its siren. The siren sounds higher in pitch as it approaches and then lower as it recedes. The farther away a galaxy is, the faster it moves away from us, and so its light stretches to longer wavelengths and appears redder. The magnitude of this redshift is expressed as z, where a given value of z tells you how long an object's light must have traveled to reach us. One of the first papers on JWST data came from Naidu, the MIT astronomer, 
and his colleagues whose search algorithm flagged a galaxy that seemed inexplicably bright and unaccountably distant. Naidu dubbed it Glass Z13, indicating its apparent distance at a redshift of 13, further away than anything seen before. The galaxy's redshift was later revised down to 12.4, and it was renamed Glass Z12. Other astronomers working on various sets of GWST observations were reporting redshift values from 11 to 20, including one galaxy called Cheers 1749, or CR2 Z17-1, whose light appears to have left it 13.7 billion years ago, just 220 million years after the Big Bang, barely an eye blink after the beginning of cosmic time itself. These putative detections suggested that the neat story known as ACDM might be incomplete. Somehow, galaxies grew huge right away. In the early universe, you don't expect to see massive galaxies. They haven't had time to form that many stars, and they hadn't merged together, said Chris Lovell, an astrophysicist at the University of Portsmouth in England. Indeed, in a study published in November, researchers analyzed computer simulations of universes governed by the ACDM model and found that JWST's early, bright galaxies were an order of magnitude heavier than the ones that formed concurrently in the simulations. Some astronomers and media outlets claimed that JWST was breaking cosmology, but not everyone was convinced. One problem is that ACDM's predictions aren't always clear-cut. While dark matter and dark energy are simple, visible matter has complex interactions and behaviors, and nobody knows exactly what went down in the first years after the Big Bang. Those frenetic early times must be approximated in computer simulations. The other problem is that it's hard to tell exactly how far away galaxies actually are. In the months since the first papers, the ages of some of the alleged high redshift galaxies have been reconsidered. Some were demoted to later stages of cosmic evolution because of the updated telescope calibrations. Cheers 1749, for example, is found in a region of the sky containing a cluster of galaxies whose light was emitted 12.4 billion years ago and Naidu says it's possible the galaxy is actually part of this cluster. A nearer interloper that might be filled with dust that makes it appear more redshifted than it actually is. According to Naidu, Cheers 1749 is weird no matter how far away it is. It would be a new type of galaxy that we did not know of. A very low mass, tiny galaxy that has somehow built up a lot of dust in it which is something we traditionally do not expect, he said. There might just be these new types of objects that are confounding our researchers for the very distant galaxies. Everyone knew that the most definitive distance estimates would require JWST's most powerful capability. JWST not only observes starlight through photometry, or measuring brightness, but also through spectroscopy, or measuring a light's wavelengths. If a photometric observation is like a picture of a face in a crowd, then a spectroscopic observation is like a DNA test that can tell an individual's family history. Naidu and others who found large early galaxies measured redshift using brightness-derived measurements, essentially looking at faces in the crowd using a really good camera. That method is far from airtight. At a January meeting of the American Astronomical Society, astronomers quipped that maybe half of the early galaxies observed with photometry alone will turn out to actually be measured. But in early December, cosmologists announced that they had combined both methods for four galaxies. The JWST Advanced Deep Extragalactic Survey, or JADES, team searched for galaxies whose infrared light spectrum abruptly cuts off at a critical wavelength known as the Lyman break. This break occurs because hydrogen floating in the space between galaxies absorbs light. Because of the continuing expansion of the universe, the ever-rising Raisin Loaf, 
the light of distant galaxies is shifted, so the wavelength at that abrupt break shifts too. When a galaxy's light appears to drop off at longer wavelengths, it is more distant. Jade's identified spectra with redshifts up to 13.2, meaning the galaxy's light was emitted 13.2 billion years ago. As soon as the data was downlinked, Jade's researchers began freaking out in a shared Slack group, according to Kevin Hainlein, an astronomer at the University of Arizona. He said, it was like, oh my God, oh my God, we did it, we did it, we did it, he said. These spectra are just the beginning of what I think is going to be astronomy changing science, he said. Brant Robertson, a Jade's astronomer at the University of California, Santa Cruz, says the findings show that the early universe changed rapidly in its first billion years, with the galaxies evolving ten times quicker than they do today. It's similar to how a hummingbird is a small creature, he said, but its heart beats so quickly that it's living kind of a different life than other creatures. The heartbeat of these galaxies is happening on a much more rapid time scale than something the size of the Milky Way. But were their hearts beating too fast for ACDM to explain? As astronomers and the public gaped at JWST images, researchers started working behind the scenes to determine whether the galaxies blinking in our view really depend upon ACDM or just help nail down the numbers we should plug into its equations. One important yet poorly understood number concerns the masses of the earliest galaxies. Cosmologists try to determine their masses in order to tell whether they match ACDM's predicted time length of galaxy growth. A galaxy's mass is derived from its brightness. But Megan Donahue, an astrophysicist at Michigan State University, says that at best the relationship between mass and brightness is an educated guess based on assumptions gleaned from known stars and well-studied galaxies. One key assumption is that stars always form within a certain statistical range of masses called the Initial Mass Function, or IMF. This IMF parameter is crucial for gleaning a galaxy's mass for measurements of its brightness because hot, blue, heavy stars produce more light while the majority of a galaxy's mass is typically locked up in cool, red, small stars. But it's possible that the IMF was different in the early universe. If so, JWST's early galaxies might not be as heavy as their brightness suggests. They might be bright, but light. This possibility causes headaches, because changing this basic input to the ACDM model could give you almost any answer you want. Lovell says some astronomers consider fiddling with the IMF the domain of the wicked. If we don't understand the initial mass function, then understand galaxies at high redshift is really a challenge, said Wendy Freeman, an astrophysicist at the University of Chicago. Her team is working on observations and computer simulations that will help pin down the IMF in different environments. Over the course of the fall, many experts came to suspect that tweaks to the IMF and other factors could be enough to square the very ancient galaxies lighting upon JWST's instruments with ACDM. I think it's actually more likely that we can accommodate these observations within the standard paradigm, said Rachel Somerville, an astrophysicist at the Flatiron Institute, which, like Quanta magazine, is funded by the Simmons Foundation. In that case, she said, what we learn is, how fast can dark matter halos collect the gas? How fast can we make the gas cool off and get dense and make stars? Maybe that happens faster in the early universe. Maybe the gas is denser. Maybe somehow it is flowing in faster. I think we're still learning about those processes. Somerville also studies the possibility that black holes interfered with the baby cosmos. Astronomers have noticed a few glowing supermassive black holes at a redshift of six or seven about a billion years after the Big Bang. It is hard to conceive of how, by that time, stars could have formed, died, and then collapsed into black holes that ate everything surrounding them and began spewing radiation. But if there are black holes inside the putative early galaxies, 
That could explain why the galaxies seemed so bright, even if they're not actually very massive, Somerville said. Confirmation that ACDM can accommodate at least some of JWST's early galaxies arrived the day before Christmas. Astronomers led by Benjamin Keller at the University of Memphis checked a handful of major supercomputer simulations of ACDM universes and found that the simulations could produce galaxies as heavy as the four that were spectroscopically studied by the JADES team. These four are notably smaller and dimmer than other purported early galaxies, such as GLASS Z12. In the team's analysis, all the simulations yielded galaxies the size of the JADES findings at a redshift of 10. One simulation could create such galaxies at a redshift of 13, the same as what JADES saw, and two others could build the galaxies at an even higher redshift. None of the Jade's galaxies was in tension with the current ACDM paradigm, Keller and colleagues reported on the preprint server arcs4.org on December the 24th. Though they lacked the heft to break the prevailing cosmological model, the Jade's galaxies have other special characteristics. Hainlein said their stars seem unpolluted by metals from previously exploded stars. This could mean they are population three stars, the avidly sought first generation of stars to ever ignite, and that they may be contributing to the reionization of the universe. If this is true, then JWST has already peered back to the mysterious period when the universe was set on its present course. Despite the big picture finding stuck, the early universe was somehow bold and brash and remarkably luminous. The objects we are finding are as massive or larger than the Milky Way, which is astounding, said Leah, who co-published a paper last week that identified six enormous galaxies that existed just 500 to 700 million years after the Big Bang. Frankly, such early galaxies are not in themselves surprising. Astronomers expected that the first star clusters sprung up shortly after the universe moved out of the so-called Dark Ages, the first 400 million years of its existence, when only a thick fog of hydrogen atoms permeated space. But the galaxies found in the web images appeared shockingly big, and the stars in them too old. One of these galaxies may have a mass of 100 billion times of that of the Sun. Our own galaxy similarly contains many billions of stars, but it has had 13 billion years to reach its size. It's bananas, said Erica Nelson, assistant professor of astrophysicists at CU Boulder, and one of the authors of the study in a press release, she said, you just don't expect the early universe to be able to organize itself that quickly. These galaxies should not have had time to form. It's just crazy that these things seem to have existed that early. Or as Leija said, we've been informally calling these objects universe breakers and they have been living up to their name so far. As a result, for a brief moment, this new reality seemed to threaten astronomers' fundamental understanding of the entire cosmos. If the starting point looked like that, could the standard model of cosmology, our strongest theory about the origins and composition of the universe, the one that didn't account for what Webb found, be wrong? But astronomers now believe that the theory can accommodate the new telescope's surprises. Recent computer simulations guided by the standard model have shown that the universe could indeed have created some of the galaxies that Webb has found. Well, in the face of it, the data don't seem consistent with cosmological models. I think what we're going to find is it's not cosmology that's the problem, but really what we understand about how galaxies formed, Leija said. The possible explanations for how astronomers got it wrong are plentiful. Perhaps early stars formed far more efficiently than we thought, through mechanisms that scientists hadn't considered before. Alison Kirkpatrick, an astronomer at the University of Kansas who studies galaxy evolution, wonders whether cosmic dust in these galaxies could be playing tricks on Webb, making stars appear older than they actually are, and maybe cosmic dust was just different back then. 
Ivo Labe, an astronomer at Swinburne University of Technology, suspects that black holes could play a role. They are among the most luminous objects in the universe when they're feeding on cosmic matter, which glows as it gets sucked in. If you dump a lot of gas into a black hole, it will start to outshine the entire galaxy, Labe said. Such black holes could make early galaxies appear brighter, more star-filled. But none of these possibilities will undo the fact that the first island universes are not what we expected. Even accounting for some new weird phenomena, everything's too big and it's too big too soon, Labe said. Investing these questions will require more web observations, particularly the kind that yield more detailed measurements of starlight, known again as spectroscopy. Astronomers need more to confirm that the most unusual galaxies they've found are the real deal. And if they really are as old and big as they seem, understanding their composition will help astronomers suss out the conditions in which they formed. Researchers are in the thick of it now, with full spectroscopic data expected to come in this spring. The effort verges on soul searching. Primordial starlight has never been so in demand and astronomers and theorists, those who observe cosmic wonders and those who explain them respectively, don't know exactly what they'll find out once they're finished. It's probably going to be something like five years until we've totally settled into our new universe theory that we've gotten from JWST, Ren Suss, an astronomer at UC Santa Cruz and Stanford said. In one sense, these new discoveries have injected drama, even anxiety, into a field that was actually quite stable. But as Nelson shared, it's incredible how the universe is just so much weirder than we thought it was. It's the beginning of the universe, so it's really fun to think about this kind of stuff. It could be said that the James Webb's first year of observations, cycle one, ended spectacularly. Astronomers are amazed and blown away by what Webb has achieved so far. But more interesting results may occur in its second year of science, or cycle two. Like cycle one, the competition was fierce, and while there were plenty of winners and some incredible science set to be conducted, there were many more who missed out on JWST's cycle two, which starts this month. As Nancy Levinson, interim director of the Space Telescope Science Institute, or STSCI, in Maryland, which runs JWST said, there was an extraordinary response from the science community. In total, astronomers submitted about 1,600 proposals to STSI for observing time on the NASA-led JWST, but only 249 were actually selected, meaning that JWST has an oversubscription of nearly 7 to 1, similar to that from the Hubble Space Telescope. To minimize the chance of bias, the process of selecting JWST's programs is completely anonymous with hundreds of astronomers from multiple subfields involved in the decision process. That said, there were clear winners and clear losers. Some astronomers, such as Nathan Adams of the University of Manchester in England, put forward multiple proposals that were ultimately rejected. We had four proposals, he said, and none of them got time, Adams says. Obviously, we're a bit disappointed. Others, such as Marianne Leimbach of Texas A&M University, were much more successful. Leimbach had three proposals approved. We're excited about the time we got, she said. Leimbach's proposals are focused on white dwarfs, the remnant Earth-sized cores left behind after stars such as our sun swell into red giants and expel their outer layers. After this dramatic event, it's thought these stellar corpses can still harbor intact planets, potentially offering us the chance to study them and learn more about the fate likely to befall Earth in five billion years when our sun enters its red giant phase. Leimbach will attempt to confirm two suspected white dwarf worlds, but will also search for up to a half dozen more elsewhere in the sky. JWST can see if any of these nearby white dwarfs look brighter than they should be, she said. If they do, that could be an indicator there's a planet there. 
JWST is really the only observatory capable of confirming them, she said. A dominant area of JWST's Cycle 1, which had about 1,200 proposals, was hunting for the earliest known galaxies in the universe, which were formed just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. The same is true for Cycle 2, with both galaxies and exoplanets getting the most telescope time. An accepted proposal from Daniel Einstein of Harvard University is hoping to push JWST to its limits by hunting for galaxies perhaps up to just 200 million years post Big Bang. Distances far away galaxies are measured in redshift. The degree to which light we see from a galaxy has been shifted to the red end of the spectrum by the universe's expansion. Einstein will hunt for galaxies beyond redshift 15, farther than any others conclusively seen so far. We don't yet have a convincing case of a galaxy beyond redshift 15, he says. It's really exciting to be able to continue the search that started in this first year. Rohan Naidu of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology will also be scouring the distant universe, but not for those highest redshift galaxies. Instead, his program, which he co-leads with Jarrett Mathie of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, or ETH Zurich, will be using a giant cluster of galaxies called Abel 2744 to gravitationally magnify the light of some smaller objects up to 750 million years after the Big Bang. The goal is to look for clumps of primordial gas which could contain clusters of population 3 stars, the first stellar generation thought to have lit up the universe. These long theorized objects have yet to be directly seen but are expected to be composed almost entirely of pure hydrogen and helium which should allow them to be enormous, each weighing in hundreds of times heavier than our sun. We're really pushing JWST to the hilt, Naidu says. We'll get back some very promising regions that might be hosting these clusters. A key target of interest for JWST's Cycle 1 was the TRAPPIST-1 system, an arrangement of seven Earth-sized worlds, some of which might be habitable, around a red dwarf star about 40 light years from Earth. While three TRAPPIST-1 programs were selected in Cycle 1, however, only one has been selected this time, led by Michael Gillian of the University of Liège in Belgium. He will hunt for atmospheres on TRAPPIST-1b and c, the two innermost planets of the system. Earlier studies of TRAPPIST-1b suggest it has no atmosphere, but Gillian says his technique, measuring the temperature difference between the day and night side of the planet, will tell us more for sure. That could have important implications for TRAPPIST-1's other, more temperate worlds that might conceivably support life. If we can demonstrate that one of these two planets has an atmosphere, we will be in a very good position to ask for an ambitious program on JWST to dig into other planets, he says. Closer to home, Christopher Glein of the Southwest Research Institute, or SWRI in Texas, will use JWST to probe Saturn's moon Enceladus, which may harbor a habitable ocean beneath its icy surface. Observation from NASA's Cassini spacecraft, which orbited Saturn from 2004 to 2017, showed that the moon occasionally ejects water from its oceans via a plume at its south pole. While no spacecraft currently orbits Saturn, JWST is the next best thing. Incredibly, it will be able to look for evidence of ocean chemistry on the surface of Enceladus, Glein says. It will even be sensitive to certain substances, such as ammonia and various organic molecules, that could tell scientists about the habitability of the moon's hidden ocean. In 2040, Enceladus' south pole will enter a long winter of darkness that will last until 2055, making a potential future landing there to hunt for life difficult. Glein, however, is hoping to show with JWST that the moon's polar plume is depositing frozen sea spray all across the surface, perhaps all the way up to the sunlit equator, where a landing could be more feasible. JWST can act as a bridge between the Sassini era and a lander on Enceladus, he says. 
Not all areas of research were so lucky. David Kipling of Columbia University submitted two proposals to use JWST to hunt for moons orbiting exoplanets, known as exomoons. JWST is the first machine humanity has ever built that is actually capable of doing this experiment, Kipling says, but both proposals were rejected. We're definitely disappointed, he says. We really felt like this was a slam dunk argument. JWST should be able to find exomoons down to the size of Europa, Kipling says, but even if it can't, the results would be pretty profound. A failure to turn up an expected population of exomoons would mean the models we use in our solar system aren't universal, he says, and could be a clue that our local abundance of lunar satellites is a bizarre deviation from cosmic norms. Time is of the essence, considering JWST is the only telescope now or for the foreseeable future that can look for exomoons. JWST could last 10 years, maybe longer, Kipling notes. If we never look for exomoons with it, we really would regret it. That would be such a shame, he said. Levinson knows that there will be some disappointments from the programs that were not selected. There are a lot of great ideas that we are just not going to be able to observe during this cycle, she says. For those that missed out, the deadline to try again and apply for cycle three is October. We have to keep trying, Kipling says. JWST is not going to be there forever. For those lucky few that did make the cut, there are scientific riches to be had. There's this whole range of science that JWST is just great for, says Levinson. We're definitely not done yet. Well, that's all we have for you today. If you enjoyed this segment, please make a comment, give us a thumbs up, and we'll see you next time.